Okay, so I'm going to take a moment and just talk about Frozen for one second. <laughs> Elsa and Anna. All of you have probably seen it, yeah? Okay, good. So you're with me. I actually cannot communicate to people with people who, who haven't seen Frozen. Because how do I explain things without using Frozen characters? Um, but no, really though. Um, they they represent... <laughs> basically, um, every... Okay, let me just say this. Every character in Frozen represents like a person you know in life. Okay? You don't believe me? I'll prove it to you. But for a moment, I'm just going to look at Elsa and Anna for a second. Okay? So, Anna is basically Egyptian. <laughs> and Elsa is a little bit daisy. <laughs> Conceal, don't feel. Think I'm kidding. Don't let it show. Um, and then Anna's just like crazy, right? She's just like all over. She's very expressive. <laughs> yeah, I'm very, very Anna. <laughs> I was like watching them, like, oh god, they made this about me. Um, but my sister, Dedia, she's like an Elsa, right? She's the older one, and she was taught that, right? She, she, she was always. If you understand, like the word. If you understand Arabic, she was the one who was supposed to be Atla all the time. Atla. Atla means like sensible, wise, you know, like don't be Madruna like Suna. My nickname, <laughs> you guys are finding out a lot right now. Um, my nickname is Suna, and I was called Suna Magnuna. Suna Magnuna means Suna the crazy. Majnuna, because we're Egyptian, we turn it into a G. That's the reason why. There's a G instead of a J, but it's Mujahid. Anyways, so um, so so this idea of um, conceal, don't feel, that's a very, sometimes it's a very cultural thing. And sometimes we as women are taught this, right? So what I'm asking you to do is unlearn that just for like two hours. And then inshallah also unlearn it after. But just at least for the next two hours, don't, don't conceal, don't feel. I'm actually asking you, giving you permission to feel and to show it so that I know whether or not, so that we can communicate, so that we can connect. And by the way, one thing that you'll find out in life is that uh, it's not about being perfect. It really is not about being perfect. And it isn't about putting on a mask and it isn't about putting on a show for the world. But, but, I will tell you this, we live in a world and especially in a culture and especially, I'm sorry, but it's, 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 it's culture upon culture upon culture. I will say this, where we are located at this time, called Southern California, in addition to our cultural baggage, in addition to being a woman, in addition to the, the Instagram, social media, Photoshop, um, you know, just image, super, just like surface kind of culture that we live in, it's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of pressure to appear perfect. There's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of pressure to hide our flaws, to not let anyone see our vulnerability, not let anyone see that we actually have problems, or that we actually have struggles, or that we actually have blemishes and scars and wrinkles. We're not supposed to show that. It's supposed to be perfectly Photoshopped, and alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, we have all the apps to you know, do away with it and have Botox and all that. But we don't just Botox our blemishes. We want to Botox our flaws. We want, we want the world to think we don't have problems. Because showing that we have flaws or showing that we have struggles is considered a weakness. Right? And that's why I mentioned Elsa because that's exactly what she was taught. She was told, you know, it's very symbolic. Put on the gloves, right? And hide it. Conceal, don't feel, be the perfect girl you always have to be. That's the idea. And then what did she do? She just let it go. She let it go. What's the let it go moment about? Well, yeah, she, she kind of became a little bit provocative, but we'll forget about that part. But the idea was, what is she letting go? She's letting go of this, 
this heavy kind of mask that she had to wear. And all of us, many of us, have different layers of that mask. Yeah? You guys are having kind of that blank look. <laughs> that like, I don't really want to admit it. Yeah. And you know, I'm not from Southern California, and so I can tell you that there is a culture in this area. There is a culture in California, and especially in Southern California, and I think maybe it has to do with being so close to Hollywood, who knows. Um, but there is a culture on top of the other cultures that we have that say you need to be perfect. And if you're not perfect, you better show the world that you are. You better not show anyone that you're not perfect. This is, by the way, so harmful. And I'm going to tell you all the reasons why, or many of the reasons why this is harmful. One of the reasons why this is harmful, and I'm going to, I'm going to actually mention this as the most important reason why this is harmful. And that is, it actually becomes a tool of shaitan. Which seems weird, right? But wait, it's, isn't that part of like religion? Aren't we, aren't, isn't, doesn't religion tell us to be perfect? Isn't it more holy to be perfect? Isn't it more righteous to be perfect? And the answer is absolutely not. In fact, it becomes a tool that shaitan uses against us by telling us that we're supposed to be perfect. Guess what? First of all, it's a lie. It's a lie. We aren't perfect, but moreover, we actually weren't designed to be perfect. But that sounds really weird though. Because every you know, lecture, and every book, and every Sunday school class taught us that we are supposed to be perfect. And we aren't supposed to make mistakes, because if we do, we'll go to hell. Right? If you mess up, you're going to go to hell, so you better not mess up. But that's actually wrong. That's actually wrong. And I will go as far as to say not only is it wrong, but it actually aids shaitan against us. How though? I'll explain how. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us as human beings, not as angels. We are different than angels. Do you think Allah made a mistake? Do you think that Allah actually meant to make us angels, but didn't? No. No. We know this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala subhanahu He doesn't make mistakes. And so there is a wisdom to the fact that Allah made us imperfect. You know that? So that's the first thing we have to understand. Is number one, we're imperfect by design. And number two, there's a wisdom and a beauty to that imperfection. But what, what possible beauty could there be in being imperfect? What possible wisdom could there be in being imperfect? I'll tell you what. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also emphasizes something about Himself. And that is His mercy, and His forgiveness, and His tolerance. Now, if we were perfect, if we never made mistakes, if we didn't have any flaws, if we never messed up, if we never fell, if we never slipped, why would we seek those attributes of Allah? Why would we, why would we need those attributes of Allah? You get what I'm saying? Why would we seek and need and, and, and ask for and turn to the mercy and forgiveness and tolerance for and so many attributes? Rahman, Rahim, Latif, Halim, Afu, so many attributes. And it is the most emphasized qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that of forgiveness and overlooking and erasing. Now, if we were supposed to be perfect, where is the relevance? So what we have to realize is this. There is a wisdom and a beauty to our imperfection. But then you're going to say, well, wait, what about striving? What about ihsan? What is ihsan then? What is ihsan then? And I will say ihsan is excellence. It is striving to be excellent, but it is not striving to be perfect. Because striving to be perfect is an illusion, and a dangerous illusion. And now I'll tell you why it's dangerous. Because the moment that we, in our human nature, slip, and we thought that we were supposed to be perfect, now something happens within the human being. There, there Now there's a very deep conflict. Here's the conflict. Hey, I was supposed to be one thing, 
and I'm not. You get it? I was supposed to be perfect. I was supposed to be this certain way, and I am not. So now what happens? Now what happens is what Shaitan wants to happen. Despair. Despair and hopelessness. What happens when you despair? What happens when you become hopeless? You stop trying. Simple as that. There's something called learned helplessness in psychology. And what happens with learned helplessness is that you just stop trying. Because you feel like, what's the point? You become so down and so, so, so hopeless that you don't want to strive anymore. This is the reason why people decide, what's the point of wearing hijab anymore? What's the, what's the point of praying anymore? What's the point of going to the masjid anymore? It's actually despair. It's actually because I feel, you know, and, and we have this unfortunate rhetoric and we have this, this um, narrative that we actually repeat a lot. And it's one of the most annoying things to me is to hear people say things like, she might as well take off her hijab. What does that even mean? She might as well take off her hijab. What it basically means is, she wasn't perfect, she wasn't flawless, she wasn't good enough, she wasn't an angel, so she should just stop trying. Who do you think that's coming from? Whose narrative is that? Who do you think is winning with that? Shaitan. Anytime you have that type of attitude against yourself or against others, you are aiming Shaitan. Because you're saying, you might as well stop trying. You weren't, you weren't perfect, so just stop trying. Well, that's great. That's exactly what he wants. That's exactly the, that's like, that's the shaitani like script. You're so bad, so you might as well stop trying. You're not sincere, so you might as well stop trying. He'll do this with everything. Even when you're trying to do a good deed. He'll use even the concept of sincerity against you. What do I mean? Well, you know when you're like, doing something and then you have this like whisper, this thought, oh you're only doing this so people will look at you. You're only doing it to show off. For example, you get up and pray. Oh you're only praying so people will think you're religious. Or, you, or you're wearing a hijab. <coughs> you're only wearing the hijab so people will look at her and say, oh look how religious she is. Okay, so questioning your sincerity, right? Well then what's the result? So just don't do it. So just stop doing it, right? Because you're not sincere. So take off your hijab, because you're not sincere. So don't pray, because you're not sincere. You're not, you're not, you haven't reached that perfection of sincerity yet, so just don't do it. You understand this is a fundamental and timeless trick of shaitan. That if you can't be perfect, just don't do it at all. Because he knows you can't be perfect. He knows that you can't be perfect. And so what he says is all or none. You know what? I'm here to tell you, this is like news flash of the day. Islam never, ever, ever taught all or none. But somehow we have it still in our mind. Yes or no? Somehow the religious dialogue has been all or none. Isn't it? You either be this perfect mauli, whatever you want to call it, like this, what is it, mullah? You either be this perfect thing, this perfect... See, what's, what is a religious person? What does a, a good religious person look like to you in your mind? Well, you have an image in your head. Everybody does. Everyone, if I tell you right now, what does a religious person look like to you? Think, think of their qualities. Think of what they're going to look like. Think of what they're going to walk like and talk like. Everyone has something that comes to mind, yes? Yes? Now examine it for a moment. It is in your mind flawless. Yes? When you think of a good godly person, you think of a perfect person, don't you? Yes or no? Admit it. Yes? No? We think, when we think of a righteous religious, we think religious, we think of a certain image, and of course they look a certain way, and then they act a certain way, they talk a certain way, and basically kind of like float around, never make mistakes, right? Almost like 
you, you just expect them to just hover. This is also the reason why we are so hard on our leaders, on our scholars, even on our hijabis, for God's sake, when they make a mistake. Because we thought they were supposed to be superhuman. Guess what? Putting on a hijab doesn't transform you into an angel. And it's not, that's not the intent. And, and, by the way, this is the other trick. Shaitan will tell you, don't do this thing until you first become perfect. So one of the tricks, for example, is um, don't start wearing hijab until you first do like this whole laundry list of things. Right? Okay, it's a trick. It's a trick. Don't start wearing hijab until basically you become an angel first. Then wear hijab. But you see, here's the trick. It's actually a logical fallacy, and I'll explain to you why. It's like a person who looks at their car and sees that it's on empty, but needs to get to Los Angeles. So they say, well, you know what? My tank is empty, but and I need to get to Los Angeles. I'll fill up once I get to Los Angeles. Then I'll fill up. Wait. You and I understand why this is a logical fallacy. Why? Because you need to fill up in order to get to Los Angeles. The fuel is what's going to help you get to Los Angeles. So when I say things like, I need to first be godly and then wear hijab. I need to first be perfect and then wear hijab. I'm saying that I need to get to LA first, then I'll fill up. The hijab is part of the path. Simple as that. It's part of the fuel. Is it, is it the whole fuel? No, of course not. But it is one of many acts which help us get closer to Allah. It is an act of obedience. Just like praying is an act of obedience. It is an act of obedience. Just like fasting is an act of obedience. And so it is helping fuel my path to God. But shaitan will say, get to God first and then fill up. Which makes no sense. And, and by the way, he'll do it with salah too. Don't pray until first your salah and your khushu are so perfect that you know, someone could cut off your limbs as we hear in the stories and you wouldn't notice. Right? Then you pray. But your salah, that's not salah. Don't even do it. That's not salah, you're just thinking about Facebook. So just don't pray. It's not good enough, so just don't do it. You get it? Allah is not all or none, folks. Allah is not all or none. This deen is not all or none. Let me tell you this. Ihsan and the path of Ihsan isn't about being perfect. It's about the struggle. The struggle that when I slip, I get back up. Simple as that. And this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he says, that all of the children of Adam will make mistakes. And who are the best of them? He doesn't say the ones that don't make mistakes. He says the ones that repent. Simple as that. And this is what we have to understand. And in another hadith he says, that Allah created human beings that will sin and repent. And if we did not sin and repent, He would remove us from the earth and bring a people that would sin and repent. This is part of the design. Now, now, it's like saying, okay, yes, I mean, so are you saying that I should just like, it's like I should just go and sin then? No, what I'm saying is there's something called gravity. No one says go and fall. But are you going to fall ever in your life? Of course. And for me to deny that is to deny reality. You get it? Simple as that. You, you don't tell your kid, um, <clears throat> you don't tell your kid, hey, go and fall. Right? But do you tell your kid, you better not fall. Right? Your kid is learning to walk. When your child is learning to walk, you don't want them to fall. You don't tell them to fall. But you also don't tell them that they will never fall. You also don't tell them that if they fall, then they're going to go to hell. Right? You know, if you look at a... 
If you look at a very good coach or trainer, someone who trains an Olympic, you know, figure skater or gymnast, now that trainer could be like, you know, just never fall. That's, that's my advice to you. Here's how, here's how to do a perfect, absolute perfect sequence. And just don't ever fall. Is that a very good trainer? No, no trainer in the world ever tells their, you know, trainee never to fall. Yes, they, 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 they want them not to fall. They try to help them to not fall. But a good trainer will teach that person how to fall and get back up. One of the, one of the parts of training a good athlete is what to do when they do fall. It's not about it's not about wanting to fall. It's not about telling someone to fall. It's about it's about knowing the reality of the world and of gravity and of the sport and then teaching them how to fall and get back up gracefully. That's what a good trainer does. And that's what we have to take back in terms of our own tarbiyah and our own um, teaching and our own training when, when we're teaching about deen and when we're teaching about religion, when we're raising our children. We, we have to go away from this very, very, very harmful rhetoric of perfection. That to be good, to be a good Muslim, you need to be a perfect Muslim. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as a perfect Muslim. But there are people, there is such thing as striving Muslims. And the ones that don't lose hope. One of the reasons why we become depressed, one of the main reasons why we become depressed is the loss of hope. It's hopelessness. It's the feeling that, you know, what's the point in trying? Or that things are not going to get better. Or that things cannot change. And, and again, these are all tools of shaitan. Shaitan wants us to lose hope, wants us to just give up. So one of the best ways to fight this hopelessness, to fight this kind of, and the depression that comes with it, is by first acknowledging that we are going to make mistakes, that we are flawed, and that doesn't mean that we're bad, it just means we're human. It's what I am. It's what, how God created me. But the best of the human beings are the ones that don't lose hope. And the ones that when they do make a mistake, they continue, they get back up, and they keep going. That's how you survive. But if you expect that there's not going to be any bumps, and the moment you hit a speed bump, you just stop your car, where are you going to get? Nowhere. You're not going anywhere. The moment you hit a speed bump, the moment you hit a, a, a pothole, you stop driving? What's going to happen? You're not going to get anywhere. No, you get in the car and you know that you're going to hit speed bumps. You know that you're going to hit potholes. And when you do, you know, what's, you know how to keep going. See, reflect on this for a second. There's a reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He's telling us about the first human being, what does He tell us about? The very first human being. When he's telling us the story of Adam a.s. What do we learn in the story of Adam a.s.? Do we learn about this flawless, perfect, per perfect person? We actually are introduced immediately in his story to his slip. To his slip, right? Yes or no? Why? Why do you think that is? Couldn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have like, not mentioned that in the Qur'an? Couldn't he have just told us about a different part about his life? You get what I'm saying? The, the problem with the way that we present superheroes is we present them as superhuman. Which by the way, that's, that's part of the reason. I mean, all these superhero movies, what are they about? They're about being superhuman. And this is what we do with our religious leaders too. I'm sorry, but it's the truth. This is what we do. We, we put them at a superhuman level. They're not supposed to like, you know, be like the rest of us. They're, they're at a different level. There's a reason Allah did not send angels to be the messengers. 
right? He sent human beings for a reason. And you know, the, the argument that a lot of people had is very similar to our own argument. Human nature just doesn't seem to change, right? Their argument of why they didn't want to believe is because you're human like us. You, you're human like us. Why should I listen to you? Why should I listen to a messenger who eats and sleeps and walks in the street just like us? You're human just like us. They didn't want, they, they, they're, you know, they're thinking that for you to, to be a teacher, for you to be a messenger, you should be superhuman. But Allah sent messengers to be human for a reason. So that we understand how, how it looks like to still be human and to be excellent at the same time. Not perfect, but excellent. Ihsan is not about perfection, right? And so Allah shows us the example of Adam alayhi salam. From the beginning, he slips. It's a slip. That's, this is the story of a, of, a, of, a, of a righteous human being. Not only a righteous human being, but a prophet and a messenger. And he slipped. Allah presents this story to us for a reason. What is that reason? To teach us what to do when we slip. That's the reason. And to show us, and to show us that you can slip and get back up and then be very, very righteous to the extent that he actually became a prophet. You guys see what happened. So it shows you that Number one, it shows you that you don't have to be perfect to be righteous. And number two, it shows that it shows um, you know that, that you can have something in your past, you can repent, and then you can become, you know, you can you can you can get back up and you can improve. Now, Adam alayhi salam, he's told not to eat from the tree, right? And then he does. And Allah tells us this. Then what does he do? This is where we have to focus. His response. رَبَّنَا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسِنَا وَإِنْ لَمْ تَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا لَنَكُونَنَّا مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ Our Lord, we've wronged our own selves. And if you do not have mercy on us, forgive us. If you do not forgive us and have mercy on us, we will indeed be among the losers. So what does this teach us about making a mistake? Number one, is taking responsibility. Rabbana Zalona and Fusana. One thing that's very fascinating about this story is the fact that you and I both know who deceived him. Shaitan, Iblis, right? But does he even mention or blame him? You know, this would be a really easy, this would be a really good time to be, he made me do it. Right? This would be a really great opportunity to say it was his fault. You know when we're fighting with our siblings? Right? What do we do? Do we ever say it was my fault? I take full responsibility. I was wrong. No, we say it was his fault. It was her fault. She made me do it. She started it, etc. Well, we don't grow out of this attitude. We don't grow out of this attitude. It's always someone else's fault that I am X, Y, Z. We are meant to be on this earth not as a punishment, but as representatives of God. Representatives of Allah on this earth. You're not being punished. You're not being punished. You are representing God. In fact, you're being honored. It's an honor that Allah created you, and Allah, even more of an honor, Allah made you Muslim, Allah put you on this earth. You are representing God. So you're not being punished. And so Adam alayhi salam, after being forgiven, came to represent God on earth for his time. And that's what we're doing. And all the children of Adam. Now, when you look at Iblis, if I ask you this question, what did Iblis do wrong? What's your answer? He did not bow. That's usually the answer. And that's, that's a great answer. But let me ask you another question in response to that answer. Y'all have been on this earth for a few years, yeah? 
In all of the years that you've been on this earth, have you ever in your life missed one Fajr prayer? Probably. How many sajdas are in one Fajr prayer? Four, folks. Four. Two in each rakah, right? So, you just admit to me that you've at least missed four sajdas in your life. At least just missed one. Uh oh. Anyone else? Like terror. At least just missed one. And you and I, at the very least, have missed four. At the very least. So, what does that mean? Is every single one of us going to hell? Is every single one of us, you know, cursed and, 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 and kicked out of it? I mean, are we all in, in pieces, just walking around? What's the difference? Anyone? Repentance. Repentance. So when I ask you what did Iblis do wrong? He didn't repent. That's what he did wrong. Because of his arrogance. But he said he didn't repent. Because guess what? Iblis was told to bow, and he refused. But Adam was also told to stay away from the tree, and he ate. So what's the difference between Adam and Iblis? Essentially, tawbah. Tawbah, istighfar, repentance, humility. You understand how important this is? This is so important. And until we understand this, we are going to fall into despair. Until we understand this, we will lose our way. We have to understand that the goal is not flawless perfection. It's repentance, it's not losing hope, it's, it's not despairing and not giving up. It's that when you slip, you keep on trying because you know that you have a merciful Lord. And you have hope in His mercy. Just as Adam did. Alayhi You know who did not have hope in his mercy? Iblis. Ablesa. Ablesa. You know Ablesa? The word Ablesa means to despair. Iblis. Ablesa. He despaired. Any kind of despair never, ever, ever comes from Allah. It always comes from Shaitan. So how do you know the difference between feeling bad about a sin, about healthy remorse, and despair. How do you know the difference? You see, the, one of the problems is this. We, in our discussion about religion, we have taught, instead of remorse, we have taught something called shame. Shame. And sometimes we even translate religious texts as shame. Like, the problem with shame is shame is a barrier between you and God. That's what shame is. Shame, when I feel ashamed in the sense of, um, let me define these words. Okay. When I commit a sin, I am supposed to feel remorse. If, in fact, we're told that if you don't feel remorse, then that's a very bad sign of a dead or sick heart. I am supposed to feel regret and remorse when I commit a sin. But what is the difference between regret and remorse and shame? There's one essential difference. And I'll tell you what it is. And that is that regret and healthy remorse will motivate me to fix it. It will motivate me to get back up and to try harder and to try to fix it, and to make amends, and to repent. You see? Because I feel bad that I hurt you, I'm going to try to make it up to you. Because I feel bad that I have done something wrong in front of Allah, I will be motivated to try hard to fix it. That means it's from Allah and it is healthy. How do I know when it's shame and it's from shaitan? Because when I feel bad, it motivates me to stop trying. It shuts me down. 
I feel so ashamed of myself that I don't want to face Allah. You know that, that whisper that you committed this sin, you're so bad and then you're going to go and pray? You're going to do that? What, what kind of hypocrite are you? What kind of two-faced person are you? How can you face Allah? That's shaitan. That's shaitan. He doesn't want you to face Allah. So he uses shame. So you always can look inside yourself and say, is this feeling, this negative feeling, is it motivating me to get closer to Allah? Or is it motivating me to go away from Him? Is it motivating me to try harder? Or is it motivating me to stop trying? And to give up? And any time it is motivating me to stop trying or to give up, then you know it is from shaitan. Because shaitan despaired and he wants us to despair too. You know that any time you want to give up, that's from shaitan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us and has promised us that he forgives all sins. All sins. And you're going to say, well what about shit? Because <coughs> there's an ayah that says he does not forgive shit, right? Associating a partner with Allah. So then I'm going to ask you a question. The ones who say that Allah is three and that Allah has a son, what is that called? Chip. But wait a minute. But wait a minute. When a Christian becomes Muslim, are they not forgiven? So does that seem like a contradiction? I'll tell you why. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Forgives all sins. Forgives all sins, including shirk, as long as we do not die on shirk. So a person who said Allah is three, or Allah has a son, a'udhu billah, and then repents and becomes Muslim, is forgiven. Even shirk is forgiven if you repent in this life. Even shirk, which is the worst sin. Even shirk is forgiven if you repent in this life. The problem is if you die on kuf, if you die on shirk. And may Allah protect us. You know the story of the man who killed 99 people. But I'm going to remind you of this story because sometimes we think of ourselves, oh, but you know what, I've done too much. I can't go back to Allah. I'm too bad. Nobody in this room has killed 99 people. Thank God. He killed 99 people. This is a serial killer. And he goes to a worshiper and asks him, can I repent? I've killed 99 people. Well, this guy is just, you did what? So he answers without knowledge. He's a, he's a righteous person and he's a worshiper, but he didn't have the proper knowledge. And so he says to him, no. <laughs> like... It's, it's over for you, like, you know, in, in so many words. He tells him, no. I mean, he just, he's just told him he killed 99 people. This is, the, this is that, that attitude of there's no redemption for you, you know? And we have a lot of people with that attitude, by the way. A lot of righteous, um, not, um, religious figures with that attitude. And he had that attitude. He said, no, you can't be forgiven. You give 99 people. So... I'm sorry, this part, it's kind of like public service announcement, right? If a dude just told you that he's a serial killer, don't make him bad. <laughs> yeah, so he kills him too. <laughs> no, it's not funny, but it's funny. It's really bad. I'm like, God. So he makes it a hundred. Imagine, okay? Um, it's like, I'd be really scared, like, this dude just told me he killed him. I'll tell him anything he wants to hear. Like, anyway, so he kills him and he makes it a hundred, hundred. But he still wants to repent. Man, this guy, like he's, imagine that. Like you and I, we think it's over for us. And we, we haven't done anything close to that, right? But he, he still has hope. Can you imagine that? He's killed a hundred people and he still has hope in God, and he still wants to repent. He still wants to redeem himself. 
He still doesn't give up. So he goes now to a scholar and he asks, I killed a hundred now. And he's like, he's very honest though. <laughs> and the scholar says, yes, you can repent. He had the proper knowledge and he told him, yes, you can repent. And he tells him to go to another city. This is part of the process because he's also telling him to leave his poisonous environment. Because you see, he didn't just live this way in a vacuum. He didn't have this poisonous life in a vacuum. He had an environment, he had company, he had people, he had, he had, a, 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 <clears throat> he had a lifestyle that was feeding that type of poison, right? So he's actually being told to leave, make hijrah. And that is actually part of the process for us. When we want to improve ourselves, and we want to repent, and we want to become better, and go to Allah, part of the process is leaving the toxic environment, leaving the bad friends, leaving the bad company that does not help us get to Allah. That's part of the process. So he leaves and on his way he dies. Halfway. So now the two angels are trying to figure out who, who takes him. The angel of mercy and the angel of wrath. Allah tells him to measure the distance between where he died and where and, 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 and the, the, the future city and then measure the distance between where he died and the past city. And whichever one is closer, you know, if it's the previous, if it's the past, then the angel of wrath would take him, and if it's the if it's the uh, future city, then the angel of mercy would take him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shortened the distance to the new city. Why? So that he could be forgiven. That's the mercy of Allah for the one who seeks it. For the one who seeks it. So we should never despair. Never despair. I want to say one thing though, and that is on the topic of pain and on the topic of depression and sadness and despair. I want to separate a couple things. One thing that was very important that I separated and I want to reiterate is the difference between healthy remorse and shame. So we, we're all on the same page about that? Okay. I'm going to turn all of you into honest. So, you don't all have to become honest. It's okay to be honest. Elsa's are good too. But, but she needs to let it go. Um, so, the other thing I want to separate is the difference between human natural sadness and despair and hopelessness. Now the reason I want to talk about this is sometimes in our discussions, especially in religious circles, our discussions about depression. A lot of times we have this narrative of if you have Iman, you would never be sad. If you have Iman, you will never be sad. Whoa, what about the year of sadness, dude? What about the prophets? Prophet Muhammad them, had the year of sadness when he lost his wife and his uncle. What about Yaqub who cried so much he went blind? What about when he says, I only complain of my sadness? Yes, sadness to Allah. These people were the closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they felt the human emotion called sadness. Sadness is not in contradiction to Iman. But I will tell you what is. Despair. Hopelessness. And that's why we have to be very, very careful in understanding the difference. I can tell you that Iman will protect you from despair and hopelessness. But I cannot tell you that man will protect you from sadness because it is a human emotion that is natural and has a purpose. It actually fulfills a purpose. Just like every emotion that Allah created, we weren't supposed to numb it. We aren't supposed to just pop a pill as soon as we feel it. Because Allah created everything with a purpose and He also created emotions with a purpose. He created even anger for a purpose. He created sadness for a purpose. Y'all seen inside out? Yes? Also very deep. These emotions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created, anger, fear, sadness, 
joy and disgust in this case. These are the these are the five main emotions psychologists talk about. Now, Allah created everyone with a purpose. And you know what when, what you learned in that in that movie is that this little girl, it's a cartoon but it's very deep. It's actually written by psychologists. But this little girl, she has all these emotions like fighting in her brain, like like trying to, you know, take t- play their part. And you have joy. Joy thinks that joy is all that's needed. Joy thinks that this little girl doesn't need sadness. She's like wants to take sadness. She makes a little circle and she says, "Sadness, stand there and just stay there. Just, just don't be involved. We don't need you, right?" Well, joy actually learns a lesson that sadness had a purpose too. What? Whoa! What do you mean? Aren't I supposed to pop a pill the moment I feel sad? Aren't I supposed to numb it? Aren't I supposed to like? You know, go 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 to social media or like drink something that'll like intoxicate me. Aren't I supposed to not feel it? Aren't I only supposed to have my happy face on? You know what I'm saying? And that's another part of the so-called culture. I'm sorry to say, you're always supposed to be happy and perky. <laughs> you used to annoy me so much. You're always, you're never allowed to be anything but a cheerleader. You know? Hi, how's it? I'm sorry. You know what I mean? Just be honest. Just be real. It's okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? But there is a difference between sadness and when it becomes despair and hopelessness and negativity. All right, and I, and I'm telling you this because I had to learn the difference. You know, it was it was a, it was a process, and I'm still learning. But I couldn't for a long time. I couldn't understand the difference. But one thing that really, really, to me, illustrates the difference is this du'a of one of the people who was tested the most by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's Ayyub alayhi salam. Ayyub alayhi salam. Study his du'a. His du'a actually kind of like summarizes this whole point and the balance. He says, So there's two parts to his du'a. The first is his acknowledgement of his hardship. He says that this hardship, this calamity has befallen me. He's suffering. He's not pretending. He's not saying, oh no, no, I don't feel anything, I'm fine, I'm fine. He's not numbing it. He's not pretending that it doesn't hurt. He's not saying it's not hard. See, we have this wrong notion of what it means to be patient. Yeah? Okay. What it means to be patient is not that I harden up and I say, okay, no, 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 I'm fine, I'm fine, everything's fine. And what I've really done is I've just numbed it. What I've really done is I've just hardened my heart. That is not the correct answer. That is not the correct answer. And in fact, what that does is like a person who has a gunshot wound and they just put a band-aid on it. You know what I'm saying? Just put a band-aid on it. Oh, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Guess what? It's not going to be fine just because you put a band-aid on it. It doesn't go away just because you put a band-aid on it. You have to treat it. You have to treat it because pain has a purpose. And this is where we go back to that purpose. Why does Allah give us pain? Why does Allah give us sadness? Because it's a motivator to change. It means, guess what? The fact that I have pain in my head or pain in my arm, or pain in my chest, it means there's something wrong, right? It means I need to go to the doctor and fix it. But if I just keep popping, you know, anesthetics, I just keep popping a, a Tylenol, or I just keep popping, you know, a- anesthesia, I, I'm, I'm just numbing myself, I'm not going to solve the problem of why it is that I have that pain. Allah put the pain there not to be permanent. Pain isn't supposed to be permanent. Pain isn't supposed to be permanent. Okay? But the pain has a temporary purpose. Temporarily. See, I have that pain in my chest. So I'll go to the doctor. The doctor says, you have a heart condition. Here's how we're going to treat it. There was a man who had a toothache. This is a real story. He had a toothache. He went to the dentist. And the dentist told him, you have an infection. So you need to take this antibiotic. But I'm also going to give you a painkiller. You know, at the same time. And he couldn't afford both medications, so he chose which one, do you think? The painkiller. You know what happened to him? 
the infection spread to his brain, he actually died. This is a real story. I read it in the news. And it is so symbolic. It's very, very meaningful. Because he just wanted the pain to go away, but he wasn't solving the problem. He wasn't solving the source of the pain. He wasn't addressing the source of the pain. And so he actually died of it. The pain was just intended to show him there's something you need to change. There's something you need to fix. You have a gunshot wound. Yes, it hurts. Yes, it, it, it may be infected, but you need to clean it out. And when you clean it out, then it will heal. But putting a band-aid on it isn't going to solve your problem. Just numbing it isn't going to solve your problem. And this is where we have to look at that balance. He says, Enni maseni adhu. Enni maseni adhu. He's saying, he's acknowledging, I am in pain. This is hard. Yeah? But what's the second half? The hope. The hope. He's not despairing. He's in pain. He's sad. He's lost everything. But he has not lost hope. That's powerful. That's so powerful. I, yes, it's hard right now. It's dark right now. It's the middle of the night, but I know the dawn is coming. I know that the sun is going to rise again. Right now, it's dark. I'm not going to pretend. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's not like it's dark and you say, Oh, no, 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 actually, the light is out. No, it's dark. But, but, I know it will not be dark forever. I know that there is sun. I know there is another day. I'm in pain now, but there will be an end to my pain. And you are the most merciful of the merciful. That's his du'a. And we are told to, to repeat these du'a. These are the du'as that will save us and teach us how to respond when we face our own pain and when we face our own sadness. So this is where I want us to come back to the balance. Don't, don't let anyone tell you. Don't let anyone tell you that if you have Iman, you just stop being human. Iman doesn't... This is the problem. Oh my gosh. Iman, deen, religion, did not come to turn us into robots. And it did not come to turn us into angels. It can't do either of those things. What it did come to do is it came to beautify our humanness. It came to beautify our humanity. And that's why we have examples of human beings that became very beautiful. Right? We have Prophet Muhammad said that. He was the example of human perfection, human excellence. Not that he transformed into an angel. He still slept and ate and had a family and, and, and cried. And, and felt pain, and went through loss, yes? His life was about loss, from the time he was a child. He went through these things. He felt scared. When he, when he first received the revelation, he was very scared. He wasn't just like, I got this. You know? I'm, I'm cool like that. <laughs> like, I got this, I'm so, I'm so whatever. He was scared. And all prophets, when they face their hardship, they never toughened up. They never did that. They always softened up and they humbled themselves and they bowed. And they asked for help. They asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help. The only way we're going to survive our storms is by doing the same. We cannot survive a storm by standing in it and, and toughening up and saying, I got this. That's not the right answer. Or, or being in the middle of a tsunami and saying, I don't think it's raining. No, actually it's really sunny. Denial is not going to help, right? Denial is not going to change it. So we have to, but, 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 there's another side. There's another side to this, another extreme, and that is focusing on the darkness. See, everything's about balance. Everything's about balance. Here's what I want you to envision. It's dark right now. It's dark right now. You acknowledge the darkness, but you don't focus on the darkness. You focus on the sun that's going to rise. While still acknowledging that it's dark. Not pretending that it's not dark, because you're not going to you're not going to solve anything that way. So you're focusing on the hope. And that is what Ayyubali Sanam did. Or, that is what Ayyubali Sanam did. Is that he is saying it's hard right now, but my eyes are on your mercy. You are the most merciful of the merciful. His, his focus was on the light that is coming. There is always light. 
And in every situation, I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to tell you this. You know what Allah says in Namal Asri Yusra? Many people mistranslate this verse. And they say after hardship is ease. This verse doesn't say after hardship is ease. This verse says with, with, with ma'a. With the hardship is ease is. Literally. Like, like if you really look at what it's saying, grammatically, it's saying with the one hardship, with, and I want to emphasize with for a moment. With the one hardship, many eases come. They come together. So even when it is dark, there is some light at the same time. It is never in this life only dark. There is always ease within the hardship. You don't have to wait. You don't have to, you don't have to say, okay, you know what? I'm basically in hell on earth right now, and um, I'm just gonna wait to be saved. Because hell doesn't exist on earth. Hell exists in hell. And so in this life, there's no such thing as hardship without ease. There's no such thing as all bad. There's no such thing as all bad. And there's also no such thing as all good either. Everything is a mix, it's a salad, you know? There's some things you like and some things you don't, but they're all together. How can you become more hopeful and more positive? It all depends on what you focus on. It all depends on what you focus on. I'm not telling you to be fake. I'm not telling you to pretend. I'm not telling you to numb it. But I am asking you to focus on the light. To focus on what's good. To focus on what you have. Focus on the ease and guess what happens to it? It grows. If there's a principle I want you to take with you, it's this. What you focus on grows. What you focus on grows. If you are a person, I just sent this meme to my, to my family today. It's a picture, two pictures. The top picture is a picture of a guy holding a slice of cake. And he's like exhilarated. And then the bottom picture is a picture of a guy who has the entire cake except one piece is taken out. And he's sad. You know why? It just has to do with what they're focused on. The dude with the whole cake except one piece is focused on the piece that's missing. That's why he's sad. And the one who has the slice is focused on the slice, and that's why he's happy. Very simple. What you focus on grows. So if you're focused on the problems, they will look bigger and bigger in your eyes. This is also one of the reasons in a public service announcement. Stop talking about Trump all the time. <laughs> or politics. Yes, I mean, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Yeah, we have hardships. Collectively, we have hardships. As a community, we have hardships. Islamophobia is real. But folks, if all we're talking about is that hate crime, that Islamophobia, that, you know, that person who they did, it, they did this to, that person who they're hating on, what Trump said about this, guess what we're doing? We're focusing on the negative. We're focusing on the darkness, and it just consumes us. And in fact, it's also, it's a, it's a fallacy, it's also an illusion, because when you focus on the darkness, it's all you see, you're actually not seeing the light. Please keep me and my family in your du'a, as-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa